Yeah, well, I have the distinct honor this uh, morning to introduce you, Rebecca, uh, Dr. Mc Rebecca McLaughlin, uh, who is a fabulous writer and apologist. I think a number of us on this call have um, already been acquainted with your work through the Gospel Coalition and um, uh, or perhaps um, folks have even used some of your many books. I think you're at about maybe 10 books or so that, that you've authored. And so, um, Rebecca, I, I first used your, um, your Christianity Today Book of the Year, Confronting Christianity, back in my uh, high school doctrine class that I taught on the right outside of the Navajo Nation Reservation, where only three of my students really identified as Christian. And most of the, the students that, that I taught, um, it, was, it was more uh, first exposure or, or maybe even a little bit of hesitation or, or skepticism about the goodness of, of Christianity. And I really appreciated that, that that book, which we used as my, um, or as, as the final exam uh, material where students had to sort of present what's the Christian perspective on these issues. And um, it, it was, it, students could just, um, without like being in the Christian no, you know, having Christian categories or, or Christian vocabulary, uh, students were really able to thoughtfully engage those important questions. And then this last fall, um, this book right here, I'm not sure if y'all can see 10 questions uh, every teen should ask and answer about Christianity, also uh, authored by, by Dr. McLaughlin, um, where it seemed to me a bit like a um, more simplified version of Christianity where you tackled some of the, the same questions. I have never seen a book have more Harry Potter references <laughs> or uh, uh, Moana and Frozen for you um, pastors out there. This is a treasure trove of excellent sermon illustrations. But um, yeah, it, it once again with this book as well, it was just very invitational, conversational, accessible. So I thank you for that. But we're not talking about either of those books today. Uh, we're looking at one of your more uh, later, uh, latest ones called The Secular Creed. And if you can see it, my screen's not quite showing, but, but this is a readily recognizable um, image that we see in front of the um, yards of, of our beloved neighbors and, and friends um, that, that give maxims by which our culture um, embraces and, and you grapple with those in, in this book. And so um, as our abide work here for the Christian Reform denomination uh, seeks to stay true to biblical and historical sexual ethics, um, your book engages in a number of places on that. And so a, a roadmap that we're gonna have for our, our time today is um, in just a bit, I'm gonna hand the baton to you and you're gonna um, help us walk through some of those um, ideas and, and understandings that you bring out in your book, The Secular Creed. Um, and then we will leave time for about 20, 25 minutes or so for, for discussion and to just grapple together. And I know that, that you need to uh, be on your way about 10 till, so that's when we'll, we'll land the plane shortly before then. But um, I'm wondering as we get into um, handing you, you the mic, I, I wondered if perhaps you could just start a little bit with, with your story. Um, I was fascinated to, to learn that you're married to, to Brian, who's an engineer from Oklahoma. You guys have three kiddos and you received your PhD in, I think, Renaissance literature. So I'm just wondering how did God move you like out of Shakespeare into what you're doing now with uh, just elbow deep in Christian apologetics? Could you share a little bit of your story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to. Great to be with you guys. Are you hearing me okay? Is this volume good? Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. In some ways, if I'm honest, uh, what I'm doing now is what I've been doing for as long as I can remember. Um, I, ever since I was probably around nine, um, I was very sure about Jesus. And most of my friends were um, 
hostile to skeptical of the Christian faith. I was growing up in London, went to very kind of academic, very uh, secular schools um, from that time onwards and, and went to Cambridge University as an undergrad, which was, as my husband says, same song, second verse. Um, I love that. It's, I don't know if that's an American expression or just him, but it's like same song, second verse, um, where the large majority of my friends were people who had principled intellectual and moral objections to Christianity. And I've known from the first that following Jesus isn't something that can just be a kind of private pursuit, but in fact uh, entails and involves sharing our faith in Jesus with any and all who will listen. And um, doing so, as, as Peter puts it in First Peter, um, giving reason for the hope that we have, but with gentleness and respect. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I went to Cambridge as an undergrad, found, as I'm sure uh, many of you guys, if you were Christians when you were undergrads, found that um, student life is actually very conducive to gospel conversations. And when I had the opportunity to stay on for grad school and study Shakespeare, I thought, great, I love studying Shakespeare, but I love even more telling people about Jesus. And this is, you know, another three years where I'll be hanging out with people who've come from all over the world to study a whole lot of different subjects, many of them much smarter than I am, and um, many of them with very principled reasons for, for not even considering Christianity. Um, and at the end of that time, I was talking with actually my, my scariest non-Christian friend. You know, most of my friends, if I invited them to something at church, they would make polite excuses as to why they couldn't come. My friend Aisha, who's a now history professor, um, she would tell me why she was ideologically opposed to everything my church stood for. You know, <laughs> we'd have that kind of level of conversation. And coming out of our PhDs, she was saying she really wanted to stay out in academia. I said, I mean, I love studying what I'm studying, but honestly, I'm not half smart enough to succeed as an English professor without sacrificing everything on that altar. And and it's just not what I'm willing to sacrifice for. And she said, well, you know, what are you? What are you willing to sacrifice for? So what I really what I'm really passionate about is telling people about Jesus. So I thought after that conversation, I thought, you know what? Um, the Church of England, which I'd grown up in, you know, spends its money on a lot of really stupid things. So they, they might as well spend the money on giving me a theological education. And so <laughs> off I went to seminary. Um, I met my, my now husband, Brian, right at the end of my term at Cambridge. And he um, he's one of the few Americans I know who really didn't want to live in England. Now, I'm always meeting Americans. Oh, I'd love to live in England. I'm, I married the guy who didn't want to live in England. Ooh. And so at the end of his PhD and my um, MDiv, or we don't call it an MDiv in England, but that's basically what it is. We, we moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, and I started working for an organization called the Veritas Forum, where I had the opportunity to um, interact with a bunch of Christian professors at leading world-class universities in fields as diverse as sort of philosophy and history and psychology and um, and physics and to, to hear from them their own stories of faith and how their academic pursuit rather than pulling up them away from Jesus actually um, was thoroughly consistent with with their faith in him so I wrote Confronting Christianity to share that with uh, the wider world um, and especially how it applies to 12 of the biggest objections people have to the Christian faith um, see, in some ways, I've been doing the, the kinds of things that I'm now doing um, in a in a sort of smaller way for as long as as long as I can remember, and I and I hope to continue doing them in ways big or small um, for as long as the Lord gives me life and breath. Um, yeah. If that's a <laughs> yeah. reasonable answer to your question, Laura. Yeah, yeah. And then, so tell us a little bit about why you wrote the Secular Creed. I, um, as as many of you may um, experience in your in your neighbourhoods, um, found in my neighbourhood in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a lot of signs that looked something like this. Mm -hmm. um, in this house, we believe that Black Lives Matter, love is love, women's rights are human rights, and then then this one, it seems like those first three claims are pretty consistent across signs, mm -hmm. and then there's like a handful of other claims that can can go on the sign depending on who made it. So this one says, no human is illegal, science is real, and kindness is everything. And I, as I, I looked at those signs, I thought, um, you know, this is this one in particular is explicitly telling us that it is a creed. In this house, we believe. Yeah. And I think Christians have often taken one of two approaches 
to signs like this and the, the set of beliefs that they represent. And there are some Christians who've, who look at a sign like this and think, do you know what, I'm, I'm profoundly aware of the history of racial injustice in this country. And I know that that's not at all what the Bible points me towards. And I've been told that actually the second claim that love is love is kind of intrinsically bundled up with the first claim that the black lives matter. And so some Christians, you know, look at these claims and think, okay, this is a package deal and I need to take one of these signs in and hammer it into my own yard. There are other Christians who look at signs like this and think, you know, there are some things on this sign that I know the Bible doesn't affirm. And so I don't want to hear any of it. Now, maybe not literally, but at least kind of metaphorically, instead of picking up the, the hammer to hammer the sign into their yard, they want to swing a hammer to knock this whole sign down. And, and any time they hear somebody talking about racial justice, for instance, um, or the ways in which Christians have acted unlovingly towards gay and lesbian people, um, or all women's rights, even any time they hear any of that talk, they just, they block their ears. Mm. And I wrote the secular creed because I actually think it, it, if you, like me, um, as somebody who wants to take their lead from the scriptures, I don't think we can take either of those approaches. I think instead of kind of wielding a hammer, we actually need to kind of get out a sharpie, so to speak, uh, and examine carefully each of these claims to see where the Bible does and doesn't uh, affirm what, what lies behind these claims. And in addition to that, I think we need to recognize that all of these claims, even the ones that actually um, are, are landing people in places that are against the scriptures, all of them depend on thoroughly Christian understandings. Um, as it were, the, these signs are, are set up in Christian soil. Because when, when your non-Christian neighbors and, and friends and mine um, think about universal human rights, when they think about the equality of men and women, when they think about love across racial difference, when they think about the fact that the, the strong and the rich and the powerful don't have the right to trample on the weak and the poor and the marginalized, they think all of these things are basic moral common sense. You know, the, we hold these truths to be self-evident, right? In actual fact, if, if we look back over the history of ideas in the last 2000 years, we'll find these are, each of those is a specifically Christian belief. And, and without Christianity, without Jesus and the foundation, it's not like, um, you know, some people think it's a bit like when you play Jenga and, and, and you, you inch out that little block at the bottom of the tower to, to build a, a higher tower. A lot of people think you can, you can pull Christianity out of the foundation of those beliefs and build a higher moral tower, actually build something better. But instead of being like pulling that little block out, it's, it's more like pulling the pin on a grenade. Actually, everything goes up in the blast when we take the scriptures and the person of Jesus out of, of the foundations of these claims. So I wrote the secular creed, as I say, to, to try to think through and to help Christians think through how um, people who, who want to be led by the Bible um, can and should respond to these, <clears throat> to these different claims. And in particular, I think a, a lot hangs on the fact that in our culture, claim one and claim two are bundled together. And there's one approach that, that says, OK, that, that's all because of the sin out there. And there's some truth in that. But I think, again, as Christians and especially um, if we're in any kind of Christian leadership, we need to recognize the ways in which the history of, of, of our sin in the sense of the, the sin of, of our churches has actually been a lot of what's tangled these up together because one of the most powerful rhetorical and kind of emotional arguments that people make today is something like this um just like you white christians back in the 60s were using your bibles to uh, affirm your like opposition to the desegregation of schools and to marriage between a black person and a white person so now you're using your Bibles to affirm your opposition to gay marriage and to transgender identities. And actually, that's a very, that's a very powerful rhetorical argument because none of us want to be 
in the position of the white 60s segregationist, right? None of us want to be, as, as people sometimes put it, on the wrong side of history. But when we look back at that claim, first we need to recognize that actually the first, the first part of the claim is true. You know, tragically, far too many white Christians in the 60s were in fact doing just that, using their Bibles to justify horrific racial injustice. But the problem with those 60s segregationists was actually not that they were too Christian, it was that they were not half Christian enough. You know, the problem wasn't they were reading their Bibles too carefully, it was that they were completely failing to be obedient to scripture. Um, you know, we, we see Jesus from the first and Christianity from the first as a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multicultural movement. We see Jesus breaking through every racial and cultural barrier of his day. We see parables like the story of the Good Samaritan um, shockingly cutting across the racial and cultural um, walls that were, that were up in, in Jesus' um, environment at that time. And, and it's only because our racial and cultural and ethnic barriers are different from those of, of his first century context that we, that we often kind of fail to, to feel the force of that. And we see through the New Testament, this extraordinary vision of, of people from all sorts of different racial and ethnic and cultural backgrounds coming together, not only as one family in the church, but even as one body. And we see this vision in the book of Revelation of um, people from every tribe and tongue and nation worshiping Jesus together. This, this is our destiny. And the, the ways in which, um, Christians have uh, have sought to justify their disparagement and abuse um, of people of, of a different racial or ethnic background. It is horrific, uh, horrific sin. Um, we only need the Bible to tell us that, to be honest. Um, we need the Bible and we need to look back over over history. Um, doesn't mean that that. Uh, sources outside the Bible can't be kind of helpful in terms of, of people's thinking, but actually even if we if we only look at the pages of the scriptures, we'll we'll see that. And so as as Christians looking at this first claim, even with the complications, even with the fact that you know there's a, a well-known organization that goes under this title that that Black Lives Matter um, affirms a whole, whole bunch of things that Christians cannot affirm, especially in terms of um, connecting all of this to, to the second claim that love is love. We can't afford, as followers of Jesus, to not be very clear that the lives of our black brothers and sisters matter. We, we can't afford to, to ignore the fact that, that our history and our, our recent history, which is the, the tragic um, reality, this is not long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. You know, this is a, a generation or at most two above us that was in fact doing what people are pointing, people outside the church and, and increasingly people within the church are pointing out is being done. So, so we need to, on the one hand, recognize that and, and think through the implications of that and work towards something better than that. And, and at the same time, look to, to the Bible to help us not make the same mistake again, because people think that making the same, same mistake again um, would be opposing same-sex marriage for Christians today. In actual fact, making the same mistake again would be go along, going along with the culture and not going along with the Bible. Because as, as firmly and clearly as the Bible points us to ward, love and fellowship across racial and ethnic and the national difference. So it calls us away from same-sex sexual relationships for Christians. Um, this isn't something that I come to uh, with without skin in the game. It, I am not someone who looked at the Bible hoping that it would tell me that same-sex marriage was out of bounds for Christians. I actually, as I said, as long as I can remember, I've been a Christian. And as long as I can remember, I've been attracted to other women. Like actually, if I could have read the Bible another way, and found that it did affirm same-sex marriage, I would have been more than happy to discover that at one point in my life. But, but I didn't. And instead, what, what I found, that the more that I've searched the scriptures, what I found is a, a story that runs from the beginning of the Bible to the end, 
that points us to the, the meaning that lies behind God's creation of male and female and his creation of, of Christian marriage. It's a story that begins in the Old Testament as God is compared time and again by the prophets to a loving, faithful husband and Israel to his often unfaithful wife. And by the end of the, the Old Testament, it's pretty clear this marriage is in, in, in crisis, essentially headed for divorce because God's people keep cheating on him with with other gods. And then Jesus steps onto the stage of human history and says that he is the bridegroom. A very strange comment to make for a man who was single all his earthly life. But one of the ways in which he's stepping into the shoes of the creator God revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. And then we see Paul in Ephesians 5 picturing um, human marriage and saying it, it, it's, it's like a little scale model of Jesus's love for his church. And then we see in the book of Revelation, this great shout going up, the wedding of the lamb has come and Jesus is married to his church, bringing heaven and earth back together. Now, this is why marriage is male, female and why husbands and wives are called to different roles. Like Christ in the church, it's a love across difference. Like Christ in the church, it's a love built on sacrifice. Like Christ in the church, it's a life creating, never ending, flesh uniting, exclusive love. So marriage is meant to point us to Christ. But it's also meant to disappoint us. Because even the, the best human marriage could only ever be a tiny echo of Jesus's love for us. And I think this is this is one of the ways in which I think as Christians, we need to to rethink our whole culture around sexual ethics, not to pull us away from the scriptures, but actually to pull us back to the scriptures. Because we have. Um, with, with often a good motivation of wanting to uphold Christian marriage and to defend and protect Christian marriage, we've actually um, ended up idolizing it. We, we've raised uh, generations of Christian kids to think that every Christian must get married and that if you, if you miss out on marriage, you're sort of missing out on the, the pinnacle of, of human fulfillment. And, you know, OK, so some people don't get married and that's unfortunate and we don't really know what to do with those people. But really, you know, everyone like the, the, the right path for a Christian is is to get married. Unfortunately, that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> but all fortunately, <laughs> depending on on how you look at it. Um, it. Paul, who had such a high vision of Christian marriage that he said it was like a, it was designed to be a picture of Jesus in his church. So that singleness was even better. Um, how far we have come from that, if, if we're honest, if we're brutally honest in, in, our, in our churches. And actually, I think in order to rediscover what the Bible really says when it comes to same-sex relationships, we need to understand not only what the Bible says about marriage, but also what the Bible says about singleness and what the Bible says about um, friendship and Christian community. Because on, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said these famous words, um, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this and that he laid down his life for his friends. Um, I sometimes slightly prov provocatively say, and I, I hope I'm, one day I'll be quoted out of context and it'll all be a total disaster. Um, but people like to say the Bible um, is against same-sex relationships. I actually think the Bible is profoundly for same-sex relationships. Um, at a level of intimacy that we Christians seldom reach. The author of John's Gospel describes himself as the disciple Jesus loved. Um, and other people in John's Gospel are described that way as well, like when Mary and Martha call for Jesus because Lazarus is dying. They don't say our brother is sick or Lazarus is sick. They say the one you love is sick. Um, we see Paul talking with extraordinary intimacy about his his male friends um, in the greetings at the end of Romans. You see four guys who Paul refers to as my beloved or the beloved. Um, we see Paul in his letter to Philemon describing Anisimus as his very heart, you know, an almost kind of uncomfortable level of intimacy in, in, in what he's saying there. Um, if, if you trace through the epistles, you'll find time and again, Paul using this effusive love language toward brothers in Christ. And, and we, we have lost that vision. 
I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm overstating that just a fraction, but I don't think much, if we're honest. I think we have lost that vision for the deep love and fellowship that can and should and must exist between believers, not only of the same sex, but actually I think especially of the same sex, because it um, the, the second claim that love is love, as we all know, the, the subtext of that is that the love between two men or two women can be just as faithful, just as enduring, just as beautiful as the love between a man and a woman. And as Christians, I think we want to say both no and yes. You know, we want to say no, because actually I, the Bible is painfully clear that sexual and romantic relationships are only appropriate to male-female marriage. And that actually any, any sexual relationships outside of that um, are, are thoroughly against God's, God's word. But at the same time, we should be the people of love. And, and, and our communities should be ones where there is actually far more love than the world has to offer. Um, my friend Sam Albury, who you may be familiar with, a wonderful pastor and teacher who is, um, like me, always experienced same-sex attraction as a Christian. Um, and he says, you know, when somebody leaves the gay community or a gay relationship in order to become a Christian, they should find more love and not less when they arrive in our in our family. Um, and that's only true sometimes, I think. Um, often people will say to me, if you're serious about what the Bible says uh, and saying no to same-sex marriage for Christians who, who may be even exclusively attracted to those of their same sex, so they're actually the large majority of, of Christians or otherwise who are attracted to the same sex are, are, are not people who are only attracted, only ever attracted to their same sex, but like, you know, are we... Are we um, consigning those people to a life of loneliness. And I want to say, if it is true that single people in our congregations are living a life of loneliness, for whatever reason they're single for, if that is true, we are massively failing to live up to what the New Testament calls us to. You know, if you read through the book of Acts, there, there are so many ways in which Christians experience suffering and persecution uh, that, you know, they're being stoned, they're, they're, they're being um, beaten, they're, they're being excluded and thrown out. None of them are lonely. That's just the one thing, that's the one kind of suffering they're not experiencing. And yet in our churches, time and again, I hear from single brothers and sisters who experience profound loneliness. So, so that is to say, as we seek to dismantle this, um, this kind of edifice that, that ties together um, the thoroughly Christian and like foundationally Christian belief that people of all different racial backgrounds are equally made in the image of God and equally beloved of God, equally worthy um, of, of our love and care and equally those for whom Jesus died. We, we need to also separate that out from this idea um, that the only real intimacy, the only real love occurs in the context of sexual romantic relationships. And we need to, to cast a vision for and live a, a life of love that actually extends way beyond that. Not because we're letting sexual and romantic relationships sort of spill over into any kind of relationship, but actually precisely because we're saying um, not, not love is love, but God is love. And he gives us glimpses of his love in different kinds of human relationship, um, father to child, husband to wife, friend to friend. So that's just to, to, to look at those claims for a minute. Um, I think the reality is, and, and forgive me, I, I don't know any of your churches individually, so this may be completely off base, but my, my hypothesis is that in many of our churches, it is easier to confess to a pornography addiction than to same-sex attraction. I'm really glad your next session is going to be on pornography. Super important conversation. I think it's vital that Christians are able to confess their pornography addiction to their Christian friends and get the help and support that they need. It's also vital that Christians who experience same-sex attraction get the, the exact same kind of help and support from their, from their Christian friends. And and we need to create a culture in, in which um, that is an expectation and, and that we um, make our, our brothers and sisters feel like they will be received and loved well. Now, what does it look like to love 
a same-sex attracted believer well um it doesn't look like affirming them in their desire for sinful things any more than um it, than loving a, a brother or sister who's in exclusively attracted to the opposite sex means affirming and encouraging them in any sinful desires that may crop up in their lives <laughs> um I, I think in our culture we, we've we've got into a place um and this spills over into the church where loving somebody and affirming everything they do seem to be kind of all bound up together actually as christians we, we can't fall for that i mean jesus calls us to love even our enemies let alone those who are um who, who are struggling with sexual temptation um you know in our own church families so we need to separate these things out but we need to be places where um all of us can be open about our struggles and and our challenges and all of us can receive the love and support that we need from our brothers and, and our sisters and that will be again part of the um ethical uh, and change that that needs to occur for our churches to be thoroughly upholding biblical ethics um i i think sometimes we can we can only be narrowly upholding biblical ethics um and not situating christian sexual ethics in the broader context of, of christian family um by which i don't mean me and brian and our three kids by which i mean uh, the, the family of of the church and it's so against our western modern culture it's so against honestly much of our historic christian culture that we're going to need to fight for the cultural change there to make to make that happen um I'll, I'll i'll tell a little story just before we we talk about women's rights human rights um a dear dear friend of mine um who is in our community group we have we host a community group my husband and i with about on, on a given Tuesday, about 25 people, mostly single, mostly in their 20s and 30s, um, who, who come to study the Bible with us. Some of them are not Christians yet. Um, some have been Christians all their lives and some have come to faith in, in the last several years. Um, and, and my friend Paige is an example of, of a kind of mixed background. So she was raised going to church um, but said that honestly, she knew more about the the kind of number of tiles on the ceiling of the church than she did about what the pastor had been preaching because she sort of wasn't really that engaged with what was being said. Um, and when she went off to college, she found herself uh, attracted to other women and a particular um, other friend of hers with whom she started a, um, a relationship that ended them, them actually getting engaged. Um, along the way, she went home to her parents and said, you know, I, I, I know you really don't approve of my relationship with my girlfriend, but like, I'm definitely going to stay with her. And they said, OK, off you go. Um, take your stuff out of your bedroom. You're no longer on our health insurance. Plan. Like they basically kind of cut her out of their lives. And on that day, my friend Paige thought, well, since I'm disappointing my parents in every way, I might as well do something else. My mom would never approve it when she got a tattoo. Uh, the tattoo she got, uh, which is on her ankle, is in Roman numerals, and it's 828. Because she learnt in, in Sunday school, Romans 828, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And she had been quite pretty sure that, that God was with her as she left her family in order to um, be with, with her girlfriend. Um, that relationship had ended about four years ago. She she proposed to her girlfriend and then two weeks later, she just realized she couldn't go through with it. And she ended up ending that relationship, um, moving to Boston and starting to really e explore Christianity for the first time her herself in a, in a more meaningful way. Um, she's now one of the fastest growing Christians I know. And a few months ago at our community group, um, a non-Christian in the group came to me and she said, I've been reading the book of Romans. I have some questions. I said, great. Um, love to hear them. Also, I said, Paige, come over here because I knew she'd been reading Romans as well. I said, Paige, show, show Catherine your tattoo and tell her what it means. And so she showed her tattoo. She read out that verse and she said, when, when I got this tattoo, I thought that it was about God getting on board with my agenda. But now I realize it's the opposite. I thought, what a beautiful encapsulation of the work that God has done in her life 
to say, actually, yes, God works for the good of those who love him in all things. And he will lead us into more love and not less. But sometimes we are going to have to trust him that he knows better than our deepest desires and instincts, than what feels most natural to us, than, than what we um, most crave and long for. And that'll be true for all of us, whatever our patterns of attraction. Um, but one of the things that, that really helped Paige was entering into a community where she was witnessing and experiencing the love between brothers and sisters in Christ where everything wasn't just all about, well, find that one person, find your soulmate, get married, there's, there's this one relationship, but instead that we we're able to experience um, love and, and, and brotherhood and sisterhood. And I find it fascinating. This is something, I wanna write a book about this at some point, I haven't quite got there yet. Um, I find it so interesting that in the New Testament epistles, almost always when you see a, a specific, um, condemnation of sexual immorality whether it's in general or, or even um, when it's in, in particular uh, around same-sex sexuality as well you will nearby find a passage calling us to brotherly and sisterly love it, it's actually the, the the antidote to sexual immorality is in fact the love of brothers and sisters in the church and, and and this this claim that love is love needs to be constructed not only by the the clear boundaries that the bible gives us around sexual relationships but also by the kind of love that people witness and experience in our fellowships and we're going to have to fight for that in in the best possible way so what about this this third claim that women's rights are human rights um by which you know tragically most people mean that abortion is the foundational right of uh, of women the, the 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 central plank of women's rights um and and especially with roe v wade being overturned last year i think these these conversations have kind of come to the fore and, and I would want to say, actually, the central plank of women's rights is not abortion, it is the cross. Um, it, if, you, if you look back over the history of ideas again, you'll see that Jesus's relationships with women radically undermined what would have seemed like a self-evident truth back in the ancient world, which was not that men and women are equal, but that, we, that women were evidently inferior to men. Uh, and the, the the strong and the rich and the powerful in, in gendered terms, men, did have the right to trample on the weak and the poor and the marginalized, which in, in gendered terms were women. The, the physical strength of men um, that in, enabled them to sort of dominate women physically and sexually, that, that, that was the norm, that was the accepted paradigm. And Jesus comes in as the strongest, most powerful man who has ever walked this earth, and chooses to die the most vulnerable sacrificial death and that is the basis that is the foundation now for universal human equality and especially for the protection of the of the most vulnerable and that is what informs um our our understanding of of women as being equally valuable to men and deserving a kind of equal dignity and respect mm -hmm. and when it comes to the question of abortion i think there are two things that are important to recognize one is it's easy actually even the, regardless of which side of the question you fall on and my assumption is as christians we, we're all falling on the on the pro-life side but it's really easy with this issue in particular for people to just simply demonize those on the other side um, it, it's easy for pro-life people to look at pro-choice people and think you are just baby murderers and you don't care. And it's easy for people who um, are passionately pro-choice to look at, at somebody like me and think, well, you just don't care about vulnerable women. And I think um, I'm not saying this is a sort of agree to disagree issue. I don't think it is. I think it's a, a, a 
massively important moral issue on, on and I think that the Christian position is is extremely clear. However, in order to have helpful conversations with folks outside the church or with folks within the church who are really struggling and feeling the pull of those justice arguments, we need to recognize that the pull of, of, of arguments for justice on the other side of the question is very real. Um, but if we think about the, the moral status of an unborn baby, the way I would look at it is this, if there is no God and if Jesus is not God's son and if he did not come to die on the cross so that you and I might be forgiven, if he was not raised from the dead and if he did not place that kind of value on us, then the baby in a mother's womb is just a collection of atoms and molecules. But if there is no God and Jesus is not his son and he did not come to die for your sin and for mine, and he, if he was not raised to welcome us into everlasting life with him, then that is just what the mother is as well. Now, actually, Christian ethics undergirds our entire understanding of what a human being is. And many of our non-Christian friends, even many of our ideological opponents are still sort of trading on that Christian ethics as they advance their own positions. Uh, there's a fascinating book written by a guy called Tom Holland, who's a British historian. I don't know if anybody has read it. It's called Dominion, How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. And he started writing that book as an agnostic who thought that things like universal human rights and care for the poor and equality for men and women, et cetera, et cetera, were moral common sense. And as he wrote it, he discovered that, no, 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 these are specifically Christian beliefs. And I, as an agnostic, actually have no basis for saying these things. Um, or or a, another fascinating book, even more widely read um, by a, a Israeli historian, you all know Harari, um, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, which he is writing as from the perspective of, of atheism, looking back over the entirety of human history. And he'll say, say things like, um, homo sapiens has no natural rights, just as chimpanzees, hyenas, and spiders have no natural rights. He says human rights are a figment of our fertile imagination. Um, he looks at the Declaration of Independence and says, uh, the Americans got the idea of human equality from Christianity. But if we stop believing in God who made human beings in his image and gave them souls and all that jazz, then, then what does it even mean to say that human beings are equal? He says, the scientific study of homo sapiens has embarrassingly little to do with human rights and equality. So, so as I said, e even where these claims um, seem most distant from from Christian belief in terms of where they, they land people, they're actually still standing on Christian territory. And, and just to, to wrap up, I'll, I'll spend a, a few minutes which will feel entirely inadequate um, on the claim that isn't, isn't on this yard sign, but is increasingly uh, an important one in our culture today and, and one that's been gaining traction, which is that transgender women are women. Um, by which people people mean that a, a biological male who identifies as female is, is just as much a woman as I am, or as Laura is, and that they should be treated as female in every context. Now, one of the things that's been fascinating to me in the last few years is seeing more and more books written by non-Christians, actually by sort of secular liberal feminists, strongly critiquing this understanding. Because actually, if you say, if you affirm that transgender women are women, then the, the claim that women's rights are human rights means absolutely nothing because we don't we have no definition of what, what a woman is. In fact, all we have is gender stereotypes. If, if we pull out, if, if my biological sex has, has no necessary re relationship with the fact that I'm a woman, if we can actually kind of unplug the biology completely, then, then what does it mean for me to be a woman? All, all we have is, is this sort of cultural stereotypes. So it's sort of fascinating how um, there, there's a, an increasing, and especially in the UK, and I think it's kind of trickling over into the US, but it's, it's sort of further along in the UK, a strong secular reaction to trans ideology. And, and I don't know whether it'll be in a couple of years or in um, a couple of decades. I don't know how long it will take, but I actually think this pendulum 
is and will swing back the other direction. Um, but one of the challenges that, that we we face um, is those of us who, who are wanting to to witness faithfully and to pastor um, faithfully in, in this cultural context is that there are so many different kinds of experience that they get bundled together under the trans umbrella. So, so two extremes would be um, on the one hand, um, a friend of mine who I got to know online uh, a couple of years ago, um, who was biologically male, um, transitioned to being both surgically and socially transitioned in um, in his, her, however you want to refer to them, um, 40s, after a long period of intense suicidal ideation and profound gender dysphoria, kind of discomfort with, with his biological sex, um, to the extent that he was planning, like, how can I kill myself and make it look like an accident so my sons don't have to live with the knowledge that their dad killed themselves? Um, so, so we have somebody like, like that on, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, we have this increasing phenomenon of um, adolescent girls in particular identifying as non-binary or as, or as trans or as gender fluid or sort of anything other than, than female, um, which, which often it, it seems to be springing up without any history of, of gender dysphoria. Um, and it is fast tracking young women um, in, in, in many cases to taking puberty blockers, to taking testosterone, to even having kind of surgical interventions that they're you know, making decisions that will change their, their bodies for all the future um, at ages where we wouldn't allow somebody to vote. Um, so, so we have this kind of vast range of different experiences that are all kind of being gathered under this umbrella um, and, and to complicate matters still further, we have the reality that some kids are born with a disorder of sexual development, or uh, which is sometimes called intersex, mm -hmm. um, to where they don't have a straightforwardly male or female biology. Um, I actually have a, a dear friend who has two, two kids in this category, um, born see, looking more female from the outside, but actually um, chromosomally male and not having a uterus. Um, and, and, and these folks are often kind of used as pawns um, by, by people on, on both sides of the equation. Um, but the reality is, you know, there, there may be people in, in our churches and our Christian communities who are in this situation or whose kids are in this situation. And when, when we talk in disparaging ways about um, people who identify as transgender, or when we sort of um, almost oversimplify the, the biological reality of sex, which I think is very important for us to to anchor on um, without oversimplifying, that they can feel just completely um, run over in the process. So there's so much need for pastoral care and sensitivity. And I, I think in, in this arena, as with all the other ones we've talked about, we need to be really careful that we are only fighting with the weapons that Jesus gives us. Mm -hmm. The weapons of love, the weapons of prayer, um, the weapons of sort of self-sacrifice and care for others. Now, that doesn't mean, as I said earlier, loving somebody doesn't always mean affirming everything they do and, and think. Um, but but it, it, it does mean something important. And, and any time we get into a space where we are just kind of hurling grenades over the, over the wall at our ideological enemies or speaking in disparaging and hurtful ways, um, in our communities, um, we're not fighting with Jesus's weapons. Um, so as as we look at as we look at these yard signs um, in our in our communities, and as we as we encounter people who have very very much been taught that this is a set of beliefs that all works together, then we need to challenge them um, with the love of Jesus, with the the clarity of the scriptures, with the identity that we can have as sons and daughters of God, um, but also with real humility. I, th I think we need to get better at what Christians should be excellent at, which is repenting and believing. Um, being willing to recognize the ways in which we individually or our communities have, have often failed to live up to Christian ethics, um, whether it comes to race or whether it comes to our treatment of 
again, there's been people outside the church or same-sex attracted brothers and sisters within the church, or whether it comes to um, how, how seriously we've, we've taken people who are struggling with, with gender dysphoria. Um, we need to repent of that. And at the same time, we need to believe what the Bible teaches and not to fall for the idea that we, we can rewrite scripture um, even in light of a history of sin. Rebecca, thank you so much, um, so much uh, there that that I'd love to jump in and just um, uh, explore a little bit more. Um, and as I I ask a question or two of my own, uh, I invite you, as Curtis already has put in the um, the chat, an invitation that uh, please send to um, in put your questions in the chat, and then Curtis will send those to me, and hopefully we'll be able to have the next half hour or so, or um, maybe 25 minutes or so to, to, um, to just engage a little deeper. Um, I'd like to start with, with sort of where, where you were landing. Um, you know, the, there, there's a line in a song that goes, God's love is wide and his path is narrow. Hmm. And, um, and, and, I find sometimes tension in that, um, even in my uh, relationships with with folks. That you know, there's there is a a clarity that Scripture has about about matters, and yet life is very complex, and relationships are very complex. My my kids, um, I've got four kiddos, preteen to um, two students in university, and um, uh, you know, all of them have relationships with um, gender nonconforming um, uh, friends, and and you know there is this this hope that we we love our friends well and we um, walk alongside of our friends well, and yet we have to navigate that in a context that, as you mentioned before. Uh, affirming and love get bundled up as sort of like one reality and so um how how is it that we love um folks in our circles whether church circles or family circles or friend circles how do we love well when when if you're not um or if if you are holding close to to scripture on things it's perceived as harmful it's as um, as not loving well. Can 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 you? Um, so I guess I'm asking a number of things. I'm I, I'm asking um, um, how how do we both hold to clarity and complexity at the same time? I'm asking also uh, secondly about this question of harm. I remember you started your book talking about. How you were sharing your story of same-sex attraction um, with with a, a lesbian couple that perceived your story as harmful, yeah. and um, um, so help us unpack this 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 loaded charge also of of harm. I think these two questions are are related. Yeah, um, yeah. With our interpersonal relationships, but yeah, what what would you say? Yeah, no, that's very helpful. I I think one of our most powerful tools for love is listening and again i think we can um we can get all twisted up sometimes by thinking if i really listen to somebody who is maybe pursuing a lifestyle or making decisions that i as a christian couldn't couldn't make and wouldn't affirm then i'm like by listening to them affirming them in that i don't think that's true i think actually you know just as if, if I make a, a Muslim friend, say, through my, my kids' school, one of the things that I want to do is to sit down with that friend and to listen to her about her beliefs. I actually, um, I'll locate them to some extent in like my understanding of what Muslims in general believe, but I'm actually most interested in what she believes, um, whether or not it conforms to, you know, what most Muslims think or whatever. And I'll, I'll want to spend quite a lot of time actually understanding what does she believe? What is her story? Why does she believe that? Um, it, in an effort to, to know her better. 
and that will in many ways be my my best route to um sharing what i believe and why mm-hmm. um but it'll also be a way that that she will receive me as somebody who actually loves and cares for her because i mean we all know we at the end of the day we all actually love to be listened to mm-hmm. we love to feel like somebody else takes the trouble to know us and i think one of the um mistakes that we can make as christians especially in, in questions of gender and sexuality is to think um okay you know for example with with somebody who's identifying as transgender um because i don't believe that a, a biological female can truly be male or that a biological male can truly be a, a woman therefore there's nothing real going on here when in fact the person I'm talking to may have a very real experience of gender dysphoria. And I can listen, I can, I can acknowledge and validate the, the reality of that experience without saying, well, of course, this means that you, um, you know, despite your biology, are in fact female. I can sit with them in that discomfort, if that, if that makes sense. And I can acknowledge, gosh, yeah, that I, I didn't even know what that feels like. Mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I can understand how, uh, to some degree, how painful that is to you. Yeah. And well, so well, I well, think... Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, so I was just going to say, I think that there are often opportunities for us to actually break down, like, some of the polarisation, um, you know, or, or maybe it's, you know, people will sometimes say to me, oh, um, a gay couple just moved in next door. Like, what shall I do? And I think, well... What would you do if a straight couple have moved to next door? Yeah, I mean, you'd mm-hmm. invite them over. You'd try to get mm-hmm. to know them. You'd just, like, mm-hmm. we don't need to expect non-believers. In fact, I think it's kind of really unfortunate if we if we expect non-believers to live according to Christian ethics. Like, why would we? <laughs> um, or, or if we think um, that, that it's our job to persuade them about Christian ethics. Actually, unless and, and until it would be a, a monumental failure if I had a, a gay couple next door and I persuaded them to leave each other and, and hook up with somebody of the opposite sex, and that was where it, that was where it ended, like that would be a, a total failure of Christian witness, right? Mm-hmm. What we want is for them to repent and believe and put their trust in Jesus. And then so much will change coming out of that. Um, the, the reality is, given our current climate, however loving we, like however truly loving we are, we will at some point be accused of being hateful. Because there is, people have no category in their minds for how you could, on the one hand, truly love somebody and on the other hand say, no, I think that what you're doing is wrong. So it's not that we won't be accused of being hateful, however loving we are, or that we should never say the hard thing because we're afraid of being accused of being hateful. But what I would say is when the accusation comes, let's make sure that it's not true. Let's make sure we have a track record of love and that we are, tr- we are doing all we can on our side to show real tangible love to those around us. And so, you know, whatever they say against us, uh, which they they likely will at some point, or they may well do, um, it, it's not actually, none of it is true. Mm-hmm. So that same question um, takes on a different resonance when, when you're um, not in a, having a cup of coffee at a coffee shop with a friend, mm-hmm. but instead you've been called on a pulpit and, and you've been called to, to give, give teaching um, or to lead folks, as you said, what Christians do really well is repentance, repenting and belief. And, mm-hmm. and yet um, there, there has been this um, troubling trend to see uh, repentance as itself or uh, repentance of, of some um, or calls for repentance and denial of self as as abusive mm. and um, um, how how do we thread the needle of um, in in our official statements and in our preaching um, speaking very clearly about about sin, and yet um, also 
having the, 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 the gentle, humble, I mean, Jesus, scripture says that, that with Jesus, you know, a bruised reed, he wouldn't break mm. a smoldering wick. He wouldn't snuff out. And, and uh, I'm, and, and yet he also was very um, fierce when it came to false teaching and when it came to, to wolves um, that would put him not a millstone around, you know, folks following mm -hmm. his way, which is a good way. So uh, yeah, how, 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 do, how do pastors in that more official capacity um, mm -hmm. also be sure that, that they're able to be folks of both truth and grace and love in, mm -hmm. in that, um, yeah, in, in the upfront position? What, yeah, what do you yeah think super that? helpful, yeah. Um, I, I love what Paul says in First Timothy. Um, a few verses after, he has listed same-sex sexual relationships among sinful practices. Um, actually, right next to when he calls out man stealing, um, enslaving people, mm. uh, in that same in that same list, a, a few verses later, he says, "This is a trustworthy saying, worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost." Now, people often have this idea that anytime Christians are, are teaching on sexual sin, they are doing so from a perspective of self-righteousness. And that accusation is not entirely without warrant, right? Like there have been plenty of times when a pastor has climbed up into his pulpit and absolutely done that, right? Um, you know, called out the sin of those out there mm -hmm. and, and, and had no humble posture toward his own sin or even toward the sin of, of those in his congregation, I think it's very easy for us to actually have double standards when it comes to sexual sin and to say, well, yeah, it's fine um, to get divorced and remarried, for example, um, even if you were really the one who caused the divorce, um, but it's absolutely not fine um, to enter into a same-sex marriage. And, and that's a, it's, a, it's an accusation of hypocrisy that people often make, and I think it's a valid one, actually. But I think the answer there is is for us to be more consistent across the board in terms of applying what the Bible says about about sexual immorality, um, and and to to do so in the context of, as I say, a, a humble posture ourselves, painting that bigger picture of what this is even all about. I mean, one of the things I sometimes say to people is, Christian sexual ethics is weirder than you think. <laughs> You know, not only do I believe that sex only belongs in marriage between a man and a woman, but I think this is actually all about a metaphor. Like this is all about pointing us to Jesus's love for his church. And so I think if we can, instead of only focusing on the 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 negative, the nose, the Bible says, if we can also point people to the to the glorious yes, the beautiful yeah. picture of the gospel that is at the center of all of this. Yeah, it, it reframes things, and and I think the extent to which we can surface in our congregations the the people who will be able to speak on these issues with personal credibility um you know we're very much in a culture where who you are uh, impacts how people will hear you that's always been true to one extent or another but but i think it's it's especially true now um and and if we if we get into a place where um our congregation where the, the same sex attractive brothers and sisters in our congregations are kind of known and, and able to actually testify in these areas. Um, I think that really helps kind of round out our, our witness. Um, uh, my church here, which I love dearly, um, I, we have a sort of almost a comic number of people who, uh, were they not Christians, would likely be married to somebody of their, their same sex. Um, some of them, like me, have always been Christians. And so this is something that's kind of has just been part of their experience. Others like my best friend, Rachel, who I talk about in the book, who became a Christian, um, having grown up as an atheist in California, uh, went to Yale with her girlfriend. Um, her girlfriend actually went to another college, but like very much in love with her girlfriend. Um, it, utterly to her surprise, became a Christian uh, mm -hmm. and is now um, doing a PhD on public theology around these, these questions. Like finding those people, I'm not saying every church has a Rachel because she's kind of special, but like, um, Finding those people and, and actually in involving them in our public witness, I think is really important because 
people can think that I'm stupid and people can even think that my story is harmful. But at the end of the day, it's, it's hard to straight up dismiss me as a homophobic bigot who just doesn't get it. Hmm. Because I do, you know, I get it. <laughs> Um, yeah. And there are people yeah. within your congregations who get it too. And if you don't know who those people are, I mean, just to, for statistics for a second, if the, the, the best research that I found indicates that about 14% of women and about 7% of men experience same-sex attraction, whereas only about 1% of women and 2% of men are exclusively attracted to the opposite sex. Hmm. So that's, let's average that out, about 1 in 10 people for whom same-sex attraction is a meaningful part of their experience. So if your church has more than 10 people, uh, or even if your church only has 10 people, that's you know, likely one out of 10. If your church has 100 people, you're probably, you're probably talking about 10 people in your congregation. And they may look like me. Um, I don't mean they look, may look exactly like me, but what I mean is um, I'm you know, a happily married mother of three. I, most people wouldn't look at me and think, there goes a woman who's always been attracted to other women. Um, it's not so it's just not not something that sort of I particularly signal um so so there will be people within your congregation in that situation and I think it's it's just truly helpful not only for for their discipleship and encouragement but also for for the broader witness of the church to in appropriate ways sort of identify those people and not I, I don't mean like shove them prematurely out into public ministry but but if there are one or two people in your congregation who are actually very faithful believers, who are clear on what the Bible says, who are living faithfully in the context of same-sex attraction, mm -hmm. I think kind of fielding that team can be really helpful. Yeah. Now, um, I see a question in the chat sort of um, that that I think piggybacks off of that a bit. So, so let's say um, uh, a same-sex married couple comes into... In, into your church, um, maybe through some of the kids programs and, uh, and, and they, they are wanting to understand what discipleship to Jesus looks like. And, um, and, and as you know, the, that is unfolded about, about marriage, um, and, and God's just what following Jesus is all about. Um, I, I had a, a uh, pastor friend who had said, you know, this, this is where I, I can't go with biblical sexual ethics because it would look like you would need to say about a God who hates divorce that the same-sex married couple in order to be faithful would need to be divorced. And like, like in practical ways, how, how do you extend uh, love and grace um, and uh, opportunities for growth. And yet then you've got this very um, um, stark kind of uh, aspect to yeah. discipleship. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you shared a little story about that. I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us about that story and then maybe you've got some other ideas of how we do discipleship well for, for folks who are coming into our congregations um, who may be in, in mm. same-sex married um, families. Yeah, in, in the secular creed, I tell the story of two women um, who uh, were, I don't think they were actually formally married, but they were living together, raising kids together, um, when at first one of them became a Christian and, and then later the other. And actually the, the one who became a Christian later emailed me last week saying, I've written a book about my story, you know, can you help me get it published? And I was like, I would love to do that because I think we need more stories like this to be told um yeah i i think two things number one um we need as i say we need to make sure that we're being consistent so if a a couple comes to your church a heterosexual couple who are not married but are living together um in in many ways we're going to kind of relate equivalently to them as we would to a, a gay couple coming to our coming to our church both of them clearly living in ways contrary to the scriptures both of them if they were to repent and believe in Jesus that would have to change um but but we need to sort of make sure that we like if, if our church practice is that and I think it should be actually that people who are um in like living with a boyfriend or a girlfriend 
are you know absolutely welcomed into the community um, and uh, given a lot of space to explore the Christian faith, um, then we should give that same kind of space to to a gay couple coming into our congregation. You know, as I say, if somebody comes to the point of, of wanting to repent and believe in Jesus, we will need to be very clear with them about all the implications that that has. Um, and for for somebody who is legally married to somebody of the opposite sex, um, it would mean dissolving that marriage. Um, because in fact, it's not a marriage from a, like it, it's a legal marriage, but it is not actually in biblical terms a marriage, right? Um, so yes, God hates divorce, but God does not consider the marriage between a man and a man or a woman as, and a woman to be married. Now, what then does that look like in, in, in practice? I think actually there's quite a lot of um, scope for difference. So the, the story that I told in the book, um, and I'll have to go just after I tell the story, I just looked at the time. Um, these two women it both came to very serious faith in Jesus. Um, one of them, her, her daughter and son-in-law, her son-in-law was a pastor at a, is a pastor at a church in Nashville. And, and what they did as a first step, they, they moved in with the pastor and his, his wife and their kids and sort of created this like mega family, as it were, of like the mother-in-law with her um, former partner and, and, and their kids just was like, okay, practically, what does this, what does this look like? Both the women who had previously been in the same sex um, sexual relationship were very clear that if if Jesus was calling them to completely end their relationship of any kind, that they were ready to do that. It was very clear to them that Jesus was now their Lord. And if that meant losing the person who had been most precious to them, hmm. Jesus was now the person most precious to them. What they both actually felt instead was that Jesus had meaningfully changed their relationship. Uh, and, and one of the women said to me, I interviewed her, and she said, I feel closer to um, Misha, her former partner, as, as a sister in Christ than I ever did when we were lovers. And I thought, what, like, wow, I mean, that, um, I, I believe her when she says that. And that is beautiful. Now, there may, my guess is that there would be many situations where a same-sex couple coming to would actually need to have a complete rupture, um, as in like they, they would not be in a position where they could healthily be around each other in a way that um, Misha and Gina are actually now like, they're continuing to raise their children together as friends, not as, not as partners, or as sisters, I should say, not as partners. Um, and their appendix has been very kind of clear in public, but like I, I can very much imagine um, other same-sex couples where that would not work at all. And actually their, for their pursuit of holiness would, would require them to just have a complete end of their relationship in any form. So I don't think this is like a cookie cutter, you know, take this example and, and apply it elsewhere. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, Jesus says anyone who wants to come after him must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. Mm -hmm. Are we asking a lot of gay couples if they become Christians? Uh, yes, but we actually should be asking a lot of anyone who becomes a Christian. And, and we're probably asking too little of ourselves if following Jesus never feels like denying yourself and take up, taking up your cross. Mm -hmm. do, do you have time for, for one final question? Um... Uh, let me see. If I if I can finish in three minutes, yes. Okay, all right. Um, you you had mentioned that you grew up in the the Church of England, and mm -hmm. and we've been following some of the the what's been happening between global Anglicans and the the Church of England about um, issues of this nature. And and in some ways, I think it really comes to a head with what you just talked about with the how how what is the call of discipleship and there within our our um, conflicted denominations or conflicted congregations there some folks in the church are saying your job is to celebrate your creationally diverse identity and your job is to uh, affirm it and others are saying no um, our our job is is to to die to self and mm -hmm. to take up our cross and follow Jesus. 
And so when you've got a, a couple like, is it Misha that you had just described, mm -hmm. um, come into your congregation and within the same congregation, there may be both of those messages. It, it could be a very confusing thing in terms yeah. of what does discipleship look like? And so in some ways, this is what our denomination is wrestling with. Um, and I'm wondering, do you have any advice for, for, for our denomination, for our churches, as we try to both affirm that God's love is wide, his path is narrow. Um, like we, we would really like to not end up in the quandary that the Church of England finds itself in right now. And, and yet um, there's that, that's precisely where uh, some of the, the, the hottest discussions are happening. Yeah. Do you have any advice or wisdom in the two minutes or one minute you have left? Yeah, a couple of things. Number one, this isn't the reason, this isn't the, the right motivation, but the reality is churches that capitulate on this issue do not thrive, they actually wither. Um, it, 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 ironically, you know, people 20 years ago saying, oh, unless the church keeps up with culture on this issue, we're just not going to be relevant, we're not going to, you know, we're going to, to um, have general decline. In actual fact, it's the churches that stand firm on these issues that aren't declining in the churches that that don't stand firm that are. Uh, again, that's not the reason. It's just an interesting observation. Um, I when when Paul says in in First Corinthians six, um, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then lists a bunch of things, including same sex sexual relationships that that walk people out of God's kingdom. We are nothing short of false teachers. If if we say otherwise, um, and, and those within our denominations who are teaching otherwise are false teachers. They are pointing beloved people, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, the way out of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. um, and there is nothing loving about doing that. Now, at the end of, the, of that passage, Paul says, and this is what some of you were, but you are washed, you are justified, you are sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, that's what all of us are if we've repented and believed. That's what some of the, the Corinthians were. You know, the, some of the very first Christians were people who'd come to Christ out of their history of same-sex sexual relationships. Um, and we need to keep believing that what the Bible says is actually true. So some people, sometimes people call for unity and they say, you know, this we shouldn't have, lose unity over this issue. Um, if you read through the Apostle Paul's letters, you will find he bangs on and on and on about unity. I mean, goodness me, is he big on unity. He says we're one body together. He hates disunity. And at the same time, he is absolutely clear on the things that, in fact, are break fellowship issues. You know, when he says in, in 1 Corinthians 5, um, I wrote to you before not to associate with a secular moral. Then he says, just to be clear, I'm not talking about non-Christians. Mm -hmm. We should actually be associated with sexually immoral non-Christians. But he says a brother or sister who calls himself a Christian who's living in, in sexual immorality that with such a person don't even eat. Mm -hmm. Like, actually, we can't play off unity against faithfulness in this area. And we're not serving or loving anybody if we pretend that we can. Yeah. Wow. Rebecca, I, I, I wish we could um, talk for hours longer, but I know your your kids are waiting for you at the bus stop. So the Lord bless you and keep you for all of your incredible work and the benefit that you have been to the church and to our lives and families individually. We just are so grateful for your, your time, your heart, your skill, your thought. And we just ask that uh, we, 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 we will, as you head out, we will be praying for you that God prospers you and your family and your ministry. Thank you Thank very you. much. Take care, everyone. Yeah.